for the next uh, uh, um, panel, we have uh, um, two people whom I really know and, and respect quite a lot. Um, uh, Marty Chavez, you've probably heard him once before at our uh, one of our panels in um, at a conference we've had previously. Uh, Marty used to. Um, I'll have Colin, who is uh, going to be moderating um, the panel, um, introduce both Marty and uh, Charles Elkin. Charles actually, Charles and I work together at Amazon, so uh, very very happy to see him uh, in our other panel today. And so, uh, Colin, uh, let's get started. And also, I think we'll have to like start the video for Marty and Charles, which I'm trying to do right now. Yep, there we go. All right, thank you, Bindu. We'll kick off our next session, which is about machine learning and finance. Uh, we have two very interesting panelists. First, we have Marty Chavez. Marty started out in uh, computer science and medicine with an MD PhD at Stanford, and then he moved to uh, into the finance industry and was eventually CIO, CFO at Goldman Sachs. And he was also a partner and global head of the, co-head of the securities division. So he was running large parts of Goldman Sachs at, at various points in time. And most recently, Marty has moved to Six Street Partners as vice chairman and partner. So a very fascinating career tra trajectory. And next we have Charles Elkin, and I believe we just had his, his uh, former student uh, in the first session. Uh, so Charles was a professor of computer science at UCSD, where he conducted influential research in machine learning on various topics, including k-means clustering and recurrent neural networks and many others. And then Charles moved to Amazon as the, uh, I believe the first Amazon fellow and uh, director for four years, and then moved to Goldman Sachs as the managing director and global head of machine learning. So Charles has also had a very uh, successful career in both academia and industry. So thank you so much for being here, both Charles and Marty. Happy to be here, thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you, Colin. And let me clarify that I'm ex Goldman Sachs also. I was at Goldman oh. until the middle of last year. All right, um, great. So I'll start off with a broad question for Marty. Can you describe the evolution of machine learning technologies at Goldman Sachs during your time there? Sure, so I, I got to Goldman in 93, coming right out of a PhD program at Stanford. And I think that is a little, little bit of an interesting thing in itself, just as a matter of history or maybe archeology. span uh, So how did I end up at Goldman? Well, I was in a, a little group of people who wrote papers on applications of machine learning in, in medicine. And we were all part of a Bayesian project, right? Our, our predecessors, my thesis advisor had uh, been working on on uh, certainty factors and other ways of handling probability and causality that we thought of as hacks. So we were gonna take a pure Bayesian approach and we're gonna find fast numerical techniques to approximate uh, the joint distribution. That was my PhD. But we're realizing that the compute power was just too low. So we're pretty disappointed. One in that group um, co-authored co the government's uh, huge paper on, uh, on AI and strategic applications for the US uh, together with Eric Schmidt. The other ones at Amazon as a distinguished uh, scientist in machine learning. Um, the third is me. I, I just randomly got an offer from Wall Street and I took it. And the fourth is by far the most successful. Uh, he thought, why, why are we doing this? These problems are too hard. Let me help people figure out what movie to watch. And of course that was Reed Hastings. So uh, uh, I ended up on Wall Street and found there was zero interest in anything that I was doing relating to machine learning on Wall Street. We had different problems to solve. So for a long time on Wall Street, there was, as far as I knew, um, and I was one of the early people working on quantitative methods in finance on Wall Street, there was almost no interest in machine learning. It seemed like pie in the sky. Um, over time, of course, that changed. I remember maybe 2010, 
one of my colleagues doing some work on genetic algorithms, which he got really excited about. And uh, he, he discovered that these genetic algorithms reproduced, um, as far as trading strategies are concerned, medium term trend followers, right? So, so then for a long time, we used to run around saying, oh, you can use these machine learning techniques, but they will just come up with techniques we had anyway. So why bother? It was later on around 20, I'll say 17, maybe 2016, 2017, when we started to see some super interesting applications. And I'll mention a couple of them and then, and then I'll turn it over to Charles who um, has a very broad view of what was going on at, at Goldman Sachs. I had much more of a trading and then CFO uh, view of what was going on. So here's, here's a couple of things that we started to notice around the 2015, 2016 timeframe. For years, we had been making options prices for our clients by taking a famous formula, a close form analytic formula called Black-Scholes, um, which had a bunch of very strict assumptions about the world embedded in it. And we would hack that formula to actually reflect the real world. So Black-Scholes would say, for instance, that volatility is a constant irrespective of the strike of the option and irrespective of the maturity of the option. Well, in reality, that's just not the case. So we'd come up with these things called volatility smiles and volatility surfaces that would kind of back our way into observing reality while maintaining the structure of Black-Scholes. Black-Scholes also says that the underlying market variables are log normally distributed and that's and the returns are normal. Um, that's also definitively not the case. And so we, we'd use fat tails and we'd use all kinds of other hacks. All right, so some enterprising person said, why are we doing all these hacks and torturing Black Shoals? Why don't we just take all the options prices that we've ever made and then fit a machine learning model to it? Okay, so we did that. Notice that we could recapitulate an options prices pricer without all of the hacks, but it was better. The machine learning version was better. It was better in the following way, which is that the risk management parameters, namely all of the partial derivatives, the famous Greeks in risk management, partial derivative with respect to market price, with respect to time, with respect to volatility, those were much, much smoother using the machine learning version. And you want smooth risk management parameters. You don't want them to discontinuously approach infinity. So that, in my personal experience, was the first time we got something better than what we had out of machine learning. And then several other things followed. So while I think personally, it is a complete pipe dream to, to imagine that machine learning will help us predict what's gonna go up and what's gonna go down. The dis distribution markets is just not stationary. And I don't think the current techniques are going to be helpful. We did find that if you were a market maker, like the Goldman Sachs trading business, you're buying when people wanna sell, you're selling to people who wanna buy, that you now have this big problem where you've accumulated some inventory. Now you can't just blow out the inventory because you'll get creamed as the market moves against you when you do that. So you have this problem of how do I hold, how long do I hold the inventory? What do I hedge it with? And then what is the expected arrival of clients who will take me out of pieces of the inventory of my bid or my offer? Turns out that machine learning techniques were amazing at that problem. We just um, pointed them at the historical experience, which was stationary, and they did a wonderful job of risk management. And that's used in production in the equities business globally at Goldman Sachs today. The last ex uh, application, which I think is incredibly exciting. Um, so we learned the hard way during the financial crisis that it's not enough to know how much unencumbered liquidity, essentially cash that the bank has access to, um, at any moment in time, we have to know how much we're going to need in the future for all kinds of things, some of which are known, like a deal we might be financing a month from now, and many of which sadly are not known. And this problem of liquidity management is an incredibly tough one. Um, it turns out that we took some regulatory data ser time series 
that we were required to provide to the Federal Reserve and applied machine learning techniques to that regulatory data series and got excellent insights and a different inventory problem, which is the super important one for banks. How much cash should we hold? Very fascinating. I see. So it's it's interesting. So just in just since 2016 with the, the options prices and then and then machine learning sort of exploded and getting lots of leverage out of many other applications. And and used yeah. every day in production for core problems of the bank. Great. All right. Now maybe let's turn it over to Charles. Do you have any anything to add with Goldman Sachs or or want to talk about any of the other companies you've been with? Maybe uh, I'll talk mainly about Amazon. I was obviously Marty has many more years of experience at Goldman Sachs and in finance than than I do. Uh, you know, certainly, everything Marty said resonated with me. Maybe one interesting uh, point to mention is that you know in the trading business, it's not just equities; it's also fixed income, it's also commodities. And um, uh, machine learning is more advanced in equities trading, as far as I can tell, than it is in fixed income and commodities. So for anyone thinking about opportunities for the future, those are certainly areas to look at. And Goldman Sachs in recent years has been getting into uh, consumer banking, also issuing credit cards, making personal loans and um, uh, raising deposits from consumers. And that's closer of course, not the same as the business that Amazon is in, which is fundamentally a consumer business. And um, something that um, uh, I found to be a fascinating difference between Amazon and Goldman Sachs is that, as Marty mentioned, the markets are really very difficult to predict. It's fundamentally non-stationary and adversarial. But if you're dealing with uh, millions or even thousands of consumers, then there are patterns of behavior where there's a lot more signal relative to the noise and uh, more stationarity. And so there's a lot of opportunity for machine learning in consumer oriented finance, whether it's lending or raising deposits. And then something which is interesting in the trading business, you know, a lot of the trading is very much person to person, human to human. And if we had a position at Goldman Sachs, we were interested in who might be the counterparties that could be interested in taking the other side of that position. And that becomes a recommendations problem somewhat similar to the Netflix problem or the Amazon um, product recommendations problem. And there's been quite a lot of success applying machine learning to that in finance also. Got it. It's interesting that, um, yeah, and in trading, Marty says there's it's a pipe dream to predict the future, but at Amazon, when there when we have millions of users with regular demand patterns, it's a bit easier. Yeah. Uh, all right, and I wanted to follow up uh, with what what uh, the the best use case of machine learning is today. For what what do you guys think will be the highest leverage use cases in the future? What do you? I have one. I have one that sure. I. Super excited about, I'm sure Charles has more. So um, let's see, how can I motivate this? So during, during the financial crisis, uh, suddenly a lot of things that we'd taken for granted turned out not to be true. So one thing is we'd always thought that the LIBOR interest rate and the Fed funds interest rate would be really close to each other because we didn't think of banks as risky but suddenly banks became incredibly risky. And so that, that assumption was, was violated. And, and then when that happened, suddenly we had this problem where there were literally thousands of legal documents that had been negotiated over the years, so relatively arcane. And I won't get into what kind of document it was, but it was to say it's the, the legal documents that govern derivatives trading. They're, they're, there's templates provided by an organization called ISDA, which is the Industry Association for Derivatives. And some of those templates govern the movement of collateral to back these derivatives exposures. And that's, you know, these are tens of trillions of dollars kinds of exposures. And, and there's thousands of documents just that Goldman Sachs had and then all of Goldman's counterparts had thousands of docs and the other competitors had thousands of docs. 
And then suddenly these two rates that were always the same were off by 300 basis points and a mad rush to go into those basements and pull out all those documents and read them and see what they said because it had never mattered and incorporate what they said into the pricing and the risk management and the daily movement of collateral. This is an immense problem. And what we had to go through, it, there were literally armies of paralegals suddenly engaged to go read those documents and capture material terms from the documents and type them into our, our systems. Okay, this problem is happening everywhere at a cosmic scale all over the financial industry in private capital, uh, business I work in now, uh, there's different documents, there's, there's limited partnership agreement documents, there's side letters. And again, they have tons of, of, of details. Sometimes it's just a number you want, like what is the management fee? But often it is much more complicated text. If this happens, then do this. If that happens, then do this other calculation. And they're embedded in all these bespoke documents. There's an urgent need for NLP software that can actually read all these things and understand what's in them and identify gaps between what is stated in the documents and what is actually happening and close those docs, those gaps. All of those ga gaps are sources of operational risk, market price risk, credit risk, reputational risk, and the industry tends to negotiate these docs and then put them away in a manila folder, right? And, and so software that can understand the docs in real time and ensure that we are actually doing what those docs say um, and doing it at scale. This, to my mind, has applications across the industry in every loan document, every limited partnership document, every derivatives document. Um, we're talking hundreds of millions of docs and no good way to address the problem right now. I think NLP is a huge part of the answer. Got it, that's interesting. I think, because uh, I know there, there has been some progress on NLP and uh, document understanding in recent years, it, it, but it sounds like uh, th these are really complex legal documents and the, the demand to start reading all of them happens so suddenly that, that we were not prepared to, to tackle this specific problem. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe as I, know, I, I think in the first session, Zach Lipton was mentioning document understanding for soap notes for uh, doctors. So maybe we'll also make progress there in, in the future. Hugely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's important to think about the different levels of understanding. There's the level which is the most holistic, maybe what Zach was talking about summarization towards the end of his session. That's the relatively easier type of understanding for machine learning methods because it's a little bit similar to object recognition and images. Um, uh, the individual pixels don't really matter. It's the high level combination, the general pattern. And then if you're talking about understanding of, of medical notes, um, uh, that tends to be more direct factual information. You have to process negation, which can be very difficult. The level of understanding which is required for these financial legal documents is extremely fine grained. Like if you wanna know what the current interest rate is on a loan, that may depend on if then conditions that have many exceptions, which are in clauses on different pages scattered around the entire hundreds of pages of the document. And uh, that's a level of um, understanding that is still pretty much beyond the um, state of the art of, of neural networks or other methods that we have. So I think it's interesting. I would predict that in the near future, there's going to be something of a resurgence of the parts of artificial intelligence that are not machine learning, the parts that are knowledge representation and then inference from knowledge, because ultimately we need to take the legal language from the documents and turn that into to knowledge bases. And you know, when I was at Amazon, we saw this um, uh, 
even on a smaller scale. So, you know, my team did quite a lot of work on developing chatbot technology. And it turns out it's not so difficult to have deep learning models that when the customer says, good morning, then the system answers, you know, good morning, how are you? Um, uh, but then if the customer says, um, uh, I only received one of the two things that I ordered yesterday, then actually having a precise understanding of what yesterday means and what two things means, and then going back to the relational database where the order was actually stored and giving the customer a precise answer, that's very difficult. Much easier for the system to say, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that that happened to you, but that's not ultimately, that doesn't solve the problem for the customer. Mm -hmm. I actually yeah. think, Charles, you make such an interesting point, right? I, <laughs> again, more, more uh, history, deep history. So I remember back in the late 80s when I was doing a PhD um, and you know, the Bayesians, we were, we were working on this Bayesian knowledge representation project. And there were others, there were psych, there were many other projects going on. And we looked at the people doing neural networks almost with a, a kind of pity and disdain, which I deeply regret, right? As in like that, that'll work. So never and 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 certainly did. Um, you, you needed Moore's law and you needed a bunch of other things to happen, but over time we've seen the powerful results. And I think it's interesting that there may be a dusting off of some of that old school work on semantic networks. And, and certainly you to Pearl has been a consistent force throughout all of this um, uh, with, with his project. And, and uh, I, I think bringing these techniques together in some way that's yet to be discovered uh, certainly seems interesting to me. Yeah, it reminds me of... Uh combining, there, there's some area of research and combining logic rules with neural networks, which is still quite a challenging problem and yeah. definitely uh, something on the horizon. Yeah. All right, any, um, any other thoughts on uh, machine learning problems that are, are still on the horizon? Maybe a couple, couple more Moore's laws in, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think, uh, again, I just think this document understanding uh, problem mm -hmm. is, is one that's, that's so important. Um, I think uh, when we go away from, uh, if we look at trading on Wall Street, right, we're, we're generally, we're trading widgets and some of the widgets are heavily standardized and they're almost atomic, a foreign exchange spot trade, right? I buy dollars, you buy yen, here's the date. Here's the exchange rate. Those are the two currencies, party A, party B, we're done. Um, as you get away from that into say fixed income, which Charles mentioned, um, the underlying instruments being traded can be customized. And in the case of derivatives, they have been heavily customized in the past, less so today since the financial crisis. But then when you get into private capital, they're, they're really infinitely customizable, these capital structure instruments and the capital structure instruments relate to a company, which is consists of a bunch of documents representing the, 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 the capital structure of the company and the incorporated and legal structure of the company, but then even more documents and workflows representing the operations of the company and finding, finding patterns in there I think is super interesting. To my knowledge, nobody has really done that. Um, not too many people have the data sets, um, but I do think that there's some interesting problems and, and opportunities there. It's more likely to have stationarity um, than, than the distribution of say equity market prices. What about, what do you think, Charles? What do you see as some of the other areas? Uh, well, what comes to my mind is reinforcement learning and thinking about this, starting more from the technology and then thinking what are the uh, applications that, that can be enabled. Um, you know, there's this saying, maybe, maybe a British saying, you know, a young man with a great future behind him. And to some extent that describes reinforcement learning, which has been one of the main areas of research in machine learning for many decades, but it's difficult to point to the successful applications of it. But I do agree with other people that sooner or later, the successful applications will be coming. And there'll certainly be opportunities in trading. As Marty was talking about a few minutes ago, 
you know, if you're a market maker, you buy when the customer wants to sell, you sell when the customer wants to buy, but you accumulate inventory and you have to make sure not to accumulate too much inventory, not to accumulate unbalanced inventory. So the price that you quote to the customer, you know, takes into account, um, uh, you know, what the customer may be willing to pay, what the recent prices for similar transactions have been, but it also takes into account what your own state of inventory is, whether you are reluctant or eager to take on the risk that the customer wants to transfer to you. So reinforcement learning is the, the framework for automating that. And um, certainly with deep reinforcement learning, we have much better algorithms than in the past. But it, it, it's always struck me that there's an, the reinforcement learning research a little bit unbalanced because most of it is about what you can call interactive learning, trial and error learning. And you know, sure, if you have a toy problem with a robot running around in a maze, then it can learn from its real-time experience. But we would never set loose an artificial agent to learn from scratch to be a trader. In fact, we'd take all the historical information that, that Marty mentioned, um, uh, and then we really would want to do reinforcement learning from that. But the, the technical term what we need to do is off-policy learning because the data was collected using particular trading strategies, but we want to use it to learn a better, different trading strategy for the future. So this type of reinforcement learning, so off-policy and batch reinforcement learning, and um, every time I see a paper on that, I, I read it eagerly because I think that's the variety of reinforcement learning that's going to have great applications. Got it. That's very interesting. Yeah, it seems out of reach. There have been some success of reinforcement learning in, in simpler settings, but, but this off policy would be quite challenging to implement today. Um, all right, so I see a, a couple of questions in chat. I'm trying to uh, look in chat as well. One of them uh, goes back to our discussion on legal documents. Uh, they say, can these legal templates be uh, framed in a more machine understandable algorithmic format? Is the, is the problem uh, that they're already algorithmic, but just hard to parse? That is an awesome question. So uh, I, I, had the, I had the same thought um, why don't we just standardize these agreements? And uh, <laughs> to me, uh, back in the post-financial crisis, actually, I represented Goldman Sachs on the board of this trade association, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, ISDA. And I, I came, <laughs> I remember this so well, I went to my very first board meeting, it was a board retreat dinner, and I said, what was the exact phrase? I said almost exactly what the questioner said. Can't we frame these legal documents in a standardized, more understandable uh, algorithmic format? And the chairman of the association looked at me and said, very first board meeting, five minutes in, already a troublemaker. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, and I mentioned that anecdote because it says it all. I'd run headlong into an entire industry. And look, I, this is not a dig at lawyers. I, 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 I love my lawyers. I, I'm happy to pay them top dollar, right? But it's an entire industry based on bespoke bilateral negotiations of docs. And it, we all know this, we've all dealt with, we've all been in transactions and there's a, there's a concept of, well, you can go, you can do it two ways. You can, manage your lawyers and you can say, I really want to do this deal. Please advise me of the risks inherent in these docs. That's one approach. Another approach is you can just tell your lawyer, go at it forever. You know, every time they send you a turn of the doc, you send them another turn where you redline most of what they said in the last turn and you give them some new language and we're just going to keep carving out little bits of advantage for ourselves and we'll do that for the next year. That's how derivatives documents get negotiated. It's how, it's how limited partnership agreements get negotiated. There are efforts to standardize but man, you, you, it's hard to imagine the resistance to that. Um, 
I, I would give another example in modeling, modeling deals, um, modeling investments in companies that happens in Excel and every model of every company ever made is lovingly bespoke where some poor junior person who are increasingly complaining loudly on the internet about their working conditions, um, some, some poor person has just been told to sit down and, and make a model. And, you know, crazily, people start typing from blank Excel workbooks, uh, which is terrifying, or often they'll start with some other workbook and, and, and modify it. But the way interest rates are expressed and the way GDP growth is expressed, it's all different cells and different spread, spreadsheets. Like I have since forever wanted to make that uh, kind of random complexity, which I think is valuable, go away. And in the area of very simple instruments, like an FX spot trade, like I described, we were very successful in doing that. We would say Excel is the instrument of evil and, and we would ban it on the trading floor. I've decided that when it comes to complex legal agreements and complex corporate models, bespoke documents and bespoke Excel models are here forever. We're not going to standardize them out of existence. We're not going to templatize them. And we're just going to have to develop ways to cope with this, with this structural complexity. I don't know, Charles, but are you as pessimistic as I am on that topic? Well, you have a lot more experience than I do, certainly, in, in, in those domains. But um, yes, I would tend to agree with the pessimism. I think there's an there's an economic angle to this. You know, like, like you said, if you can manage your attorneys and say, I want to make this deal happen, or you can manage your attorneys and say, I want um, to you know, optimize my side of the deal. And ultimately, um, you know, if optimizing your side of the deal is worth tens of millions of dollars, then it's worth it to spend a lot of money on the attorneys. And it would be the wrong economic decision to use a, a template um, if that template was going to be costing you tens of millions. I get, yes, and, and an analogy I would give maybe, maybe worth thinking about. So uh, back in the days when I had to wear suits and couldn't just wear hoodies to work, um, I, I invested in really well-tailored, super comfortable, extremely expensive suits that fit like pajamas because I had to live all day in them. And so I think there's value to customizing that, that suit. On the other hand, for socks, I think black socks are fine. Like I've been buying the same, the same brand of black socks for the last 30 years. And I, I'm not that interested in innovation in socks. And I'm not that interested in paying $10,000 for a customized pair of socks that someone has knitted, right? And so I think a lot of the complexity that exists out there in the world is in the form of customized socks that's not really valuable. And a relatively small percentage of it is, is customized suits, which might have some value to some people. And, and just as a society, we've got that, we've got that balance wrong, but I've learned the hard way that, that, that changing it is now. Yeah, it's like boiling the ocean. And so I would just encourage people who are exploring this area to, to you know, I, I think we can actually go a long ways with the techniques that we've got and techniques just to be yet to be invented. Um, so Charles, you know, as um, you, you mentioned um, some of these complicated documents with clauses and lots of logic embedded in them in our current NLP techniques don't, don't do a great job of that. Um, I'm wondering if there's some, something intermediate. I am seeing some technologies uh, come around and maybe, and I'm helping out a couple of companies that are in early stages of doing this where it doesn't um, tell you the answer. It does, you know, here's what I want. I would want the, the capital waterfall of a, of a limited partnership agreement. Um, to, I would want a computer to read the legal doc and give me the code that calculates the waterfall. But I might be happy with something lesser, which just immediately points me to the right places in the documents and all the places in the documents that I need to look at. Um, so it was kind of an attention focuser as opposed to an answer 
And I think some of these things could be hugely helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of potential and opportunity there. And it's, it's interesting that the most successful types of neural network model for many applications nowadays are these transformer models. And what's fundamental about a transformer model is that really every part of the input is paying attention to every other part of the input and you can actually analyze the model to see which parts of the input are related. And then nowadays we have hierarchical transformers. So um, absolutely, I, I think we could imagine um, uh, methods that would take a hundred page legal document and they would find all the paragraphs that were relevant to the quarterly interest rate. And they would find which paragraphs were potentially modifying which other paragraphs. And that could really improve the efficiency of the um, uh, paralegals and the lawyers who then are doing the actual reading and drawing the actual conclusion from the documents. And um, maybe I'll just use the opportunity. There's a company that Goldman Sachs actually is an investor in called 98.6 based in Seattle. And I think they have a, a really innovative but sensible and simple approach to really using machine learning to improve healthcare. And essentially they, ask the patient questions and the patient provides answers and then they do machine learning on top of the answers to select follow-up questions. And then all that is turned over to the human provider, a physician or, or other. So it, in the worst case, the system has made mistakes, hasn't understood the patient and the human has to start over. But um, most of the time, the information that is being obtained from the patient is very relevant and the human provider can then pay direct attention to the provider, to the patient, doesn't have to answer the basic questions. And the um, uh, time for a patient visit, I think the numbers that I heard was reduced from about 25 minutes on average to nine minutes on average. So huge productivity improvement, even though the machine learning is not actually doing any medical diagnosis or prescription or treatment. That's exciting. Got it. Yeah, that also, the yeah, very fascinating discussion that, that led into one of my other questions about how, uh, I was going to say an anecdote, we're in, in the game of chess uh, for a while, humans, human, uh, AI assisted humans were, were the best, but, but then eventually uh, the AI is just outpaced humans by so much that the humans are basically useless. And it's interesting to hear these, uh, these uh, settings where AI assisted humans can really speed up uh, patient visits. And uh, I, I wonder if one day the, the AI will be so good that there's no <laughs> use for the human anymore. I think, uh, I think it's probably, you know, I, I hate making predictions on this and Charles would be curious what you'll say, but um, look, I think we are maybe entering a, an era in the next few years where in finance at least, but also in medicine, um, AI as assisting humans is going to be powerful. I think we're just entering that era, right? Like I, I don't have as, nearly as many AI or ML assists to what I want to do as I would like to have, though we've noted some that exist, like helping us in inventory risk management, helping us in liquidity management, helping us make options prices, right? So, so we're just in the early days of, of AI being really helpful to humans. I think I, I would expect that there's a decade plus, maybe more of, of that, like let's just make ML that's actually embedded in our workflow and is helpful to human beings. I think that would be very, very productive. I don't really see um, humans not being necessary in these processes um, anytime soon, though. I think uh, we've got to imagine as we get to singularities that that, that is going to happen. I'm not worried about it for any of the career lifetimes of the people listening to this call. Yeah, I, 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 <clears throat> I would agree. I think that um, for the foreseeable future, a lot of what we're going to have is human assisted AI. Um, uh, and then that's going to evolve not into fully automated AI, but it's going to evolve into what you could call. So what we have now is AI assisted humans and that'll evolve into human assisted AI. So for example, you know, we have automated trading systems 
And the decisions about the trades are being made by the algorithms, but there are humans who are monitoring the environment closely. So if something is happening that is not part of the input data to the automated systems, then the humans can intervene and uh, switch off the automated systems or tighten the risk limits on the automated systems. And so I think the first there's AI assisted humans, then there's human assisted AI, and then maybe there's more and more degrees of full automation. I think we're also going to be gradually changing our mind about what is the highest value work and what is the uniquely human work you know nowadays in in medicine of course you know physicians are paid more than nurses physicians are um, uh, treated as heroes more than nurses often but in fact a lot of the work of the physician is uh, likely easier to automate over the next decades yes. uh, than the work of nurses and so i think we'll see a gradual shift in understanding of where the human value is and where the most complexity and sophistication is. Yeah, I think we're entering a very interesting time with uh, AI assisted humans, human assisted AI, and uh, it uh, makes sense about your predictions and how that'll play out and how long it'll take before pure AI is, is the best. Um, all right. so. Uh, maybe I can go back to chat. Uh, in fact, we already answered some of the questions in chat about NLP and NL natural language understanding. There's one uh, one interesting question about, uh, it's kind of a long question about um, uh, basically are there AI models that can extract information in the hierarchical way like humans do? I think even Charles mentioned uh, hierarchical transformers at one point. And they also say, uh, for example, humans learn like in a bottom-up approach, like where we, when when we're toddlers, we start to uh, learn the alphabet and then gradually uh, go up. But uh, yeah, what do you guys think about this type of hierarchical machine learning model? Charles, why don't you uh, why don't you take? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, well. I wonder you know, how much content and significance there can really be in sort of individual words like hierarchical or phrases like bottom up. Um, I think you know, the complexity of human learning, the complexity of machine learning is not going to be described by um, uh, single words or single alternative uh, metaphors. If you look at the, the history of psychology, the history of cognitive science, the history of artificial intelligence, there are different metaphors that have been used. Um, and they tend actually to say more about um, uh, the, con the environment of the people creating the metaphors than actually about the nature of the brain or the nature of the mind or the nature of learning. You know, in the uh, 19th century, after the industrial revolution became prominent with steam engines at its center, then people had um, you know, metaphors of you know, humans as being somehow steam engines and having governors being um, in the brain. And you know, that didn't turn out to be uh, useful from the point of view of scientific understanding of cognition. Then there were metaphors of clocks, um, uh, metaphors of digital computers, even artificial neural networks are only a, a metaphor for the brain. What a neuron does is a lot more complicated than what a node does in an artificial neural network. So I really think that we don't know a lot about uh, human learning and um, uh, we don't even know whether it's bottom up or top down. It's probably some very complicated combination of both of those and then of things that really can't be described as either bottom up or top down. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're, we're nearing the end of our uh, session, but I saw one other question in chat that was also the, the same question I was going to ask. And uh, I guess the title of the session is technically humans versus AI in finance. And uh, we have spent the majority of it talking about AI. So the, the question is, what are some tasks where humans are still far, far better than machine learning algorithms? Well, I guess. I'll, 
I'll give one um, based on my own personal experience. I, when I was CFO of Goldman Sachs, of course, I had the, um, uh, the role of hosting the quarterly earnings calls with the analysts and the investors. And um, some, some of those calls went better than others. Uh, I don't think that we're in any near-term danger, and I'm talking decades of an AI hosting an earnings call where you could get an arbitrary question from an arbitrary person about an extremely complicated global global company, right? So I think at that kind of level of synthesizing information um, and and saying the appropriate thing that's accurate and necessary and uh, can be consumed in an appropriate and understandable way. I don't, I don't I think any activity that resembles that uh, we're, we're light years away from AI being able to do. What do you think, Charles? I, I think that there's one category of problem where it's going to be a long time till we use machine learning or AI, and that is very lumpy decisions. Um, so at Amazon, for example, of course, uh, we used machine learning for making recommendations, but we're making millions of video watching recommendations every day to millions of people. And if we get a recommendation wrong, it's not particularly costly. We want to get the recommendations uh, as correct as possible on average. But then if you, there are lumpy decisions, like should Amazon license the rights to Frozen from Disney? That's a multi-million dollar decision. It has all sorts of ramifications. There are all sorts of alternatives. You know, if we have the Lion King, then is it important that we have Frozen also, or is it rather that if we have the Lion King, then it's all right if we don't have Frozen? And But ultimately, you can't license half of the movie, so it's a lumpy decision. I think that's the uh, a type of scenario where it's going to be a long time until machine learning algorithms are taking the wheel from the humans. There's a question in the chat about robo-advisors. Um, that's that's an area where I'm gonna say uh, the computers are going to do really well, really soon. Um, part of it is just that for almost everybody, the right investing strategy is five ETFs rebalanced quarterly, right? And, and there's a few questions that you would need to ask that age and financial situation, retirement and educational goals, uh, buying a house, those things. There's a number of questions, but the right financial advice actually can be delivered by a robo advisor, no question about it. And a lot of the complexity that happens in the customized delivery of advice is in my view, pointless and unnecessary and counterproductive. Uh, complexity, but there's a lot of entrenched interests um, that want to deliver that kind of complexity. Now, here is one thing, though, that we have noticed in, in, in efforts to build and deploy robo-advisors, um, and I think this maybe gets to what Charles was saying earlier and some things that humans are, are better at, um, is uh, you know the thing that I learned when I was in med school that was the most valuable to the rest of my career was a bedside manner. Investment advisors need to have a really great bedside manner when delivering bad news, especially in some kind of financial crisis, right? During the pandemic, um, people are not happy talking to their robo advisor as they see the value of their portfolio drop. They wanna to talk to human beings. So I think in that example of robo advisors, we can see some areas where we probably the, the AI is already better, more useful, more effective than the human, human though maybe not adopted yet. And in other parts of the job, um, people won't be happy with the robo advisor, not anytime yeah. soon. Got it. Yeah, very interesting answers. All right. I, I believe we're out of time. I apologize for going a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you very much to our to Marty and Charles. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Marty and Charles. Thank you so much again.